Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another lecture brought to you by the Malaysian Obstetric Medicine Society. Ladies and gentlemen, a slight deviation from maternal medicine. Today, I would like to highlight the antenatal management of IVF pregnancies. Now, I, for one, believe that IVF pregnancy per se is a high-risk pregnancy, and we need to be very clear we need to refine our current management because I believe the complications following IVF pregnancy is just as significant as any other high risk pregnancies. So with that, I would like to disclaim that I've got no conflict of interest in this talk. Although almost 30% of patients seen in my maternal medicine clinic is actually a pregnancy conceived via IVF. Now, ladies and gentlemen, why this talk? I think all of us can appreciate that in the last two decades, there's been significant advancements in the assisted reproductive technologies. Couples who are unable to conceive are now able to get pregnant. Now, what is the current challenges, ladies and gentlemen? Has the obstetric world evolved on parallel with the evolution of the ARP? We can make couples pregnant. Can we continue to sustain that pregnancy? Can we ensure optimal maternal and fetal outcomes? Can we support this pregnancy for optimal outcomes? And that is going to form the gist of my talk for today. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to share four of some of the IVF consults that I encountered in my own high-risk maternal medicine clinic. Now, patient number one, so the IVF pregnancy after five years of subfertility, the BMI was 30 kilograms per meter square. She has got no significant medical illness. She did complain of significant hyperemesis gravidarum, but she lost almost four kilograms over a period of three weeks. Unfortunately, she presented with a sudden onset of left-sided weakness for the first time sudden in onset, and she was about nine weeks pregnant. We did a CT brain, it was normal, but our suspicion of a cerebral venous thrombosis was confirmed via a CTV, and yes, she did have a cerebral venous thrombosis. Her risk factors, ladies and gentlemen, IVF pregnancy, IVF medications, first trimester, BMI of 30 and hyperemesis. And hence, ladies and gentlemen, we do encounter a lot of thrombosis among IVF mothers, especially in the first trimester. And this is usually a cerebral venous thrombosis. Question number two, a 35-year-old teacher, IVF pregnancy due to male factor, presented with sudden onset of breathlessness. She thought she's going to die. A CTPA showed bilateral massive pulmonary embolism. Once again, the risk factors were IVF, the risk factors were pregnancy, the risk factors was the first trimester. So thrombosis in the first trimester following IVF pregnancies is not uncommon. Question number three, a common challenge among managing, management of IVF pregnancies is preterm labor. Now this patient had a IVF pregnancy in the past, she unfortunately had a pregnancy loss at 20 weeks. The cause was confirmed to be an infective cause. The organism was Klebsiella pneumonia, and this was further verified by the placenta HPE. She had another eventual IVF pregnancies, and since the first cause was an infective cause, we followed her up with normal cervical length measurements, which was all normal which was all above 2.5, and there was no evidence of cervical shortening. Unfortunately, despite having normal cervical lens, she presented with spontaneous pervaginal bleeding and had another pregnancy loss at 19 weeks. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not uncommon for IVF patients to have preterm labor, but usually it is related to two conditions, an infection, which is not uncommon, or a placental syndrome from the inflammation, but it is rarely a survival cause. Now, patient number four is a doctor 
a healthcare professional. She's currently pregnant, and this is the fifth successful IVF pregnancy after almost 15 years of marriage. It was not joy to be pregnant, but what she complained was a four-week history of feeling heaviness, of unable to swallow and feeling a lump in the throat. And she often described this to be having difficulties in swallowing. The ENT review was normal. The cardiorespiratory examination was normal. We finally came to a diagnosis. She actually suffered from panic attack and anxiety. So ladies and gentlemen, mental health among, especially among IVF pregnant mothers are significant. We should seriously look, screen, support, and treat. Uh, three days ago, while I was still preparing for this talk, we had another mother who conceived via IVF after 10 years of marriage. She presented with painless vaginal bleed for one day. When she came to our ED, she had a cervical dilatation of almost three centimeters. And it was 7 p.m. at night. We had to go in for a rescue cervical package. Despite the protrusion of the membranes, we tocalized her with indomethacin. We managed to reduce the bulging membranes. The procedure was successful. But ladies and gentlemen, she's still admitted in our ward. It only has been three days. She's got a long journey ahead of her because she's only 20 weeks pregnant. Having managed all these complicated patients and having seen a significant number of preterm labors, ladies and gentlemen, I for one believe that the preterm labor is often not due to the cervix. The cervix is merely a victim. The cervix is not the villain. There are two reasons why these patients present in preterm labor. The reason number one is because of infection. And what is the association between IVF pregnancies and infection? I shall justify in the next few slides. And the second reason for preterm labor, it is usually related to the placenta, which is the villain. It is the placental syndromes. Is the pregnancy failure? Is the pregnancy rejection? It causes the mother to come in preterm labor. It is not the cervix, which is often innocent. Thus, ladies and gentlemen, prophylactic measures such as prophylactic circlages, history indicated circlages, or even Arabian pessaries are really not the true management. This will all cause more harm than benefit because the cervix is just a victim. Now, Antenatal management of IVF pregnancies are not something new, ladies and gentlemen. In the last three to four years, there's been numerous guidelines focusing on how we should be managing IVF pregnancies. The TOG came up with a guideline almost a few years ago titled Antenatal Management of Singleton Pregnancies Conceived via AFP. And last year, the Society of MFM Consult Series in U.S., came up with a consult series number 60 with regards to management of pregnancies conceived via IVF. But ladies and gentlemen, I believe we still need to watch this piece. I believe IVF pregnancies per se are high risk pregnancies. I believe there needs to be a significant modification of care. And I believe all these patients need an expert to take care of them, ideally, a maternal fetal medicine or an obstetrician whose experience, the reason why I shall justify in the next few slides. Now, what are the significant complications following IVF pregnancy that I see in my own clinical practice? I think mental health among these patients are extremely high. It is not uncommon. It can be because of a successful IVF, they can have anxiety. It is perhaps because of the prolonged wait, it is perhaps the uncertainty, it is the unsuccessful IVF, it is perhaps the pregnancy losses and miscarriages. So as obstetricians caring for this vulnerable group of patients, screen, support, manage, advise, empower, because mental health among this cohort of patients are extremely high. The second 
is the incidence of thrombosis. This is how I've illustrated two patients who presented with thrombosis in the first trimester. One had pulmonary embolism, two had cerebral venous thrombosis. The incidence of thrombosis is highest in the first trimester. And this is especially among patients who have conceived via IVF, especially coupled with hyperemesis gravidarum, especially in the first trimester. So any patient with IVF who presents with a red flag, breathlessness, headache, new onset neurological signs, think of a thrombosis. Third, the significant cause, which I think we should know and how to manage is placental syndromes. The incidence of placental syndromes following IVF pregnancies is extremely high, namely because the body sometimes try to reject the placenta and reject the pregnancy. Although aspirin is not routine, I think aspirin is a significant intervention and medication to manage placental syndromes. And I think if one can optimize and manage placental syndromes, the outcomes following IVF pregnancies will be far better. It's not just aspirin, ladies and gentlemen. There are various other tools that one can use. Placental biomarkers such as aspirin, PLGF, various medications to reduce in endothelial dysfunction and asfleet, such as tetins, such as metformin, are currently being postulated. Uterine R3 dopplers may be used as an adjunct in the first trimester. Growth scans are useful because the incidence of fetal growth restrictions are high, and you can also measure placental thickness as a marker of placental syndromes. Now, how do you manage placental syndromes? This is not just aspirin. People are talking about low molecular weight heparin in certain selected group of patients. Statins, which reduces as fleet endothelial dysfunction. And immune modulators, such as hydroxychloroquine and azathioprine, which reduces the incidence of placental rejection, which is almost similar to an organ rejection. This is a group in UK who are currently looking into the use of Tacrolimus. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe if one can manage and control placental syndromes, the outcomes, especially in terms of miscarriage, preterm deliveries, preeclampsia, and fetal growth restrictions can be minimized. And finally, preterm delivery. Ladies and gentlemen, it is often, once again, not the cervix. Do not undertake routine prophylactic cervical subconscious. Do not use or abuse Arabic pessaries because the reason for the preterm delivery following IVF, it is not the cervix. It is namely for two reasons. It's because of the infections, which is prevalent among this special group of cohorts, especially sexually transmitted diseases. And second, the preterm delivery is actually because of a placental syndrome. The placenta is the villain. It is not the cervix. It is not a cervical insufficiency. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what are the various outcomes with regards to IVF practices? You can have a fresh and a frozen IVF cycles. What is the difference? The current evidence says there's no difference between a fresh and a frozen IVF cycle because the pregnancy outcomes are the same. How about a difference between IVF plus ICSI or should we do ICSI for all IVF practices? Well, ladies and gentlemen, pregnancies following ICSI, there's no increase in adverse maternal outcomes. But pregnancy conceived via ICSI has got a higher risk of perinatal outcomes, namely because of the manipulation of that embryo. Hence, ICSI pregnancies is associated with a higher risk of perinatal outcomes. How about pre-implantation genetic screening? Ladies and gentlemen, this should not be routine for all couples, but perhaps limited for couples where there is a genetic cause. And one should also appreciate the pathophysiology of blastocyst mosaicism. So although there was a pre-implantation genetic screening, the current recommendation is also to offer prenatal screening, either a non-invasive screening, a chorionic velar sampling, or and an amniocentesis during pregnancy, namely because of the risk of blastocyst mosaicism. So ladies and gentlemen, pre-implantation genetic screening is wonderful, but that alone does not exclude a genetic cause. 
also like to highlight a new evolving and increasing an understanding of a new syndrome in pregnancy. It is not new, but I believe the maternal medicine will now have appreciated this condition. It's got three words and it's called chronic histiocytic intervillocytis. Now, what is chronic histiocytic intervillocytis, ladies and gentlemen? Try to imagine an organ which is being rejected. And the organ which is being rejected here is the placenta. Now, the key to diagnosis, there's an increase in ALP among mothers. But the gold standard in diagnosis is the placenta, where you'll find increase in histiocytes. So it is the pregnancy. It is the manipulation of the IVF pregnancies. It is the infection. It is the inflammation that increases the histiocytes in the plastic placenta and eventually ends up in a pregnancy failure. So these patients will have recurrent miscarriages. These patients will have preterm labor. These patients may have fetal growth restriction. These patients may have stillbirth. And these patients may also have preeclampsia. So the key is immune modulation. Some people have started statins. Some people have started low molecular weight heparin. Some people talk about hydroxychloroquine. Some people talk about azathioprine. And there's a group in UK that is also talking about tacrolimus. As obstetricians, if you've got a patient who has got a recurrent pregnancy loss, it's good to think about this condition. It is good to confirm by examining the placenta. The key lies in the presence of histiocytes in the placenta. Now, what are the pearls of management? I think pre-pregnancy care, not just for the mother, but also for the husband is essential. What should you do in the pre-pregnancy state? Establish a cause for the subfertility. Exclude a genetic cause, and it should not be pre-implantation screening for everyone. It should not be ICSI for everyone. Apart from ensuring a healthy mother, Apart from ensuring a mother with a normal BMR, it is also important to ensure a healthy partner, a partner with a normal BMI, and ideally both below the age of 35. Now, what are certain targets? HbA1c is currently being used as a marker and a prognosticator for adverse pregnancy outcomes. If the HbA1c is below 48, the risk of diabetes is none. If it's below 42, the risk of GDM is low but it is still used as a prognostic marker, not as a diagnostic marker. Now, TSH. Now, the thyroid hormone and thyroxine has been abused by numerous people. We do not have to routinely give all pre-pregnancy mothers thyroxine to drive their TSH. No. The recommendation is to target a TSH level of below 5, which is not associated with any adverse pregnancy outcomes. We do not have to treat you thyroid patients with TPO antibodies who are positive. We do not need to drive a TSH of below 2.5. Recommendation is 5. The ferritin level should be above 30. And now people, more and more people are appreciating the importance of vitamin D. And vitamin D insufficiency is not associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes, but vitamin D deficiency, namely a level of below 50 is associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes. And hence the target is to keep vitamin D levels above 50, although there are no benefits of routine screening except among high-risk group of patients. Now, what else should we screen? Apart from diabetes, apart from thyroid, apart from iron deficiency, I think we should screen for infections. Now, what infections should we screen? We should screen for asymptomatic bacteria by sending urine cultures. The incidence is 5 to 10%. We should also screen for sexually transmitted diseases because this cohort of patients, especially those who are subfertile with tubal diseases, has got a higher incidence of sexually transmitted diseases. So the normal swabs, ladies and gentlemen, is insensitive. We should seriously do cervical and genital swabs looking for sexually transmitted diseases, and they should be treated if present. I have highlighted the importance of paternal health, the importance of paternal BMI, and the father should ideally stop smoking. Now, vaccinations are important. Patients should be made as healthy as possible. And now we know that a booster and a COVID vaccine does not cause infertility. 
patients should ideally have had minimum completed their primary booster. They should be vaccinated for varicella, rubella, hepatitis B, and influenza, if not already taken in the last 12 weeks. Now, what two supplements are important? Folic acid. Not everyone needs five milligrams of folic acid. The recommendation is 0 0.4 milligrams of folic acid. And the recommendation for vitamin D is 800 to 1,000. Nothing beyond that, unless the patient has got vitamin D deficiency. It's good to document this care plan. When the patient has got high risk, for example, PMI, chronic diseases, underlying medical conditions, it is okay to refer these patients to the maternal medicine clinic. I, for one, run my own pre-pregnancy clinic once a week, focusing into such patients. And these patients perhaps need empowerment, specially scan input to optimize their pregnancy outcomes and to optimize their own health. So let's come back to the million dollar question, ladies and gentlemen, how much of folic acid does a pregnant mother need? The recommendation now is to supplement 0 0.4 milligrams for every single healthy individual for three months before pregnancy up to 12 weeks. There's no benefit beyond 12 weeks unless the mother needs folic acid for her own health. How about patients who have the previous neurotube defects? The recommendation is 4 milligrams is sufficient, not forever, for a period of at least 6 to 8 months, and then continue at least until 12 weeks. And there's no benefit beyond 12 weeks. Now, who needs higher dose of folic acid? Who needs 5 milligrams of folic acid? This is limited to patients who are on anti folate medications. Example, patients on rheumatoid arthritis on sulfasalazine, they need 5 milligrams of folic acid. Epileptic patients on carbamazepine, they need 5 milligrams of folic acid. But various patients, most patients for well and healthy, only need 0 0.4 milligrams of folic acid. Just like how I've highlighted in my previous talk, vitamin D now, ladies and gentlemen, is slowly becoming the important supplement of choice. Although we have plenty of sunshine in Malaysia, a significant amount of Malaysians are vitamin D deficient. There's one study that showed that almost 80% of babies born in Malaysia are vitamin D deficient. And based on this Cochrane review, looking into supplementation of vitamin D, although the evidence is inconclusive, the Cochrane review suggests that supplementation of vitamin D reduces preeclampsia reduces gestational diabetes, reduces low birth weight, and I, for one, favor vitamin D supplementation, especially among high-risk group of patients, apart from folic acid supplementation. And the recommendation is not to universally screen, but to universally subscribe at least 800 to 1,000 international units of vitamin D. HbA1c. It is a tool that can be used not to exclude diabetes alone, but also to predict adverse fetal outcomes. And I, for one, use HbA1c as a screening tool. If the HbA1c is below 48, the mother is unlikely to be diabetes. If it's below 42 millimoles per litre, she's unlikely to be GDM. And there's no adverse fetal outcomes at term, especially macrosomia large for gestational age and still birth. And you can use HbA1c as a prognostication marker early in the pregnancy, especially in the pre-pregnancy state. We did talk about thyroid supplements. Ladies and gentlemen, if a patient is thyroid, but he's got TPO antibodies, or the patient is asymptomatic, but has got a TSH of above 2.5, should we treat this group of patients? Does that improve pregnancy outcomes? Based on this tablet study, a wonderful trial that was published a few years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, the evidence is clear. Routine supplementation of thyroid patients who are TPO antibodies positive does not improve pregnancy outcomes. The recommendation now, ladies and gentlemen, is to keep a TSH of below 5 because that has got no adverse maternal, fetal, 
or long-term neurodevelopmental issues in the fetus. We do not need to chase a TSH of below 2.5 because that is way too low and you will be medicating a lot of pregnant mothers without any benefit. The recommendation is only to treat patients who have got a TSH of above 5. How about thrombophilia screening? We should not screen patients for thrombophilia because that is not associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes, that is not associated with miscarriages, that is not associated with recurrent IVF failures. Now, this wonderful paper was published in the BMG a few months ago, published by Hastan Shehata. It looked into thrombophilia prevalence among IVF pregnancies. It looked into patients who had recurrent first trimester miscarriages and the general cohort. There was no significant difference between those who have got recurrent first trimester miscarriages and those in the general population. So, ladies and gentlemen, we should not screen for thrombophilia because a significant amount of Malaysians, especially Asians, do have asymptomatic protein S deficiency, but that is not associated with an adverse pregnancy outcome. So, screening is not beneficial. Treatment is not beneficial, they surely do not need low molecular weight heparin. So a significant amount of them will be asymptomatic carriers without any pregnancy manifestations or benefit. What should we screen for? Antiphospholipid syndrome, but not protein C, not protein S, and not antithrombinary. How about screening for methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase? Now, the FACT trial, which was published in the BMG a few years ago, showed that routine supplementation of folic acid did not improve pregnancy outcomes. And hence, the recommendation is to give 0.4 milligrams of folic acid up to 12 weeks and not beyond. In the past, just like how we have increased screening of thrombophilia, there used to be certain cohort of doctors who actually screened for MTHFRZ. FRZ gene. But ladies and gentlemen, the evidence is clear. There's no benefit of screening for MTHFR because a significant amount of them will be carriers, but there is no benefit and it does not improve pregnancy outcomes. So screening will cause more anxiety. Screening will detect asymptomatic patients. Treating will not improve pregnancy outcomes. So just like thrombophilia, Screening for MDHFR and treating MDHFR will not improve pregnancy outcomes, will not improve miscarriages, will not improve the success rate of IVF. With that, ladies and gentlemen, what are the other essential trials? I'm going to summarize five important trials. The CERM trial looked into supplementing doxycycline among patients with recurrent miscarriages. It showed no benefits. Ladies and gentlemen, do not routinely supplement doxycycline, but screen for urea plasma. The patient has got urea plasma positive treat with doxycycline, but if the patient does not have urea plasma, supplementation of doxycycline does not render any benefits. Just like how we have discussed in the previous slides, there's no benefit of screening for inherited asymptomatic thrombophilia. There's no benefits of treating, but this is going to be evaluated by the ALIVE-2 trial which is recommended. The results are awaited, but I, for one thing, that this trial will prove that anticoagulation for asymptomatic homophilias is not going to improve pregnancy outcomes. Progesterons, especially dufastons and all progesterons, is another medication that's commonly used and abused in the first trimester. There are numerous trials that looked into progesterone supplementation in the first trimester, namely PRISM and the PROMISE trial. Now, PRISM looked into progesterone supplementation among women who are bleeding early in the pregnancy. It showed no benefit. The PROMISE trial showed into progesterone supplementation among asymptomatic women to prevent miscarriages also showed no benefit. So, ladies and gentlemen, we should stop routine supplementation of oral dufastan. If the patient is symptomatic, the patient is asymptomatic, even if the patient has got recurrent miscarriages because it is not of any clinical benefit to the patient. 
In the response file, looked into GCSF, colonic circulate GCSF among women with unexplained miscarriages. That also showed no benefits. We should also not give immunotherapy. We should also not abuse steroids. We should not spiral down the line of natural killer cells, which is inadvertently higher among any mother with a pregnancy failure, because screening and treatment has not been proven to improve pregnancy outcomes. Metformin, ladies and gentlemen, is another medication commonly used for obese PCOS patients. Although it may be beneficial among this selected group of cohorts, metformin used during pregnancy, although it was proven to be efficacious as high as 40% among GDM and diabetic mothers by the MRG trial, may have two implications. It causes small baby. It causes metabolic acidosis. And this wonderful trial, the MIG TOFU trial, which followed up all the infants for up to seven to nine years who had antenatal exposure of metformin showed that these infants were smaller at birth and they were even smaller up to the age of seven to nine. So ladies and gentlemen, if you used metformin for infertility issues, it should quickly be stopped once the mother is pregnant. If the mother is not diabetic, if the mother is not GDM, Giving metformin, you're going to cause more hypoglycemias, and that is going to cause more IUGRs and SGA and small babies. Now, we did talk about infections and preterm labor. We did talk about infections and IVF pregnancies. Why are the infection rates high, ladies and gentlemen? I believe it can be explained by five or six possible interventions and hypotheses. I believe the infection rates are high, perhaps related to the procedure of oocyte retrieval. I believe the infection rates are high, perhaps related to the procedure of embryo transfer. I believe the infection rates are high because this group of women also use a lot of vaginal suppositories. I also believe they have got a lot of interventions, namely transvaginal scans, and we also sometimes use a lot of first trimester add-ons to reduce the immunity of this woman, such as progesterone and immunotherapy. So these asymptomatic infections are picked up very early on in the pregnancy. It does not manifest until later in the second trimester, but there's a significant change in the immunity of the mother. And this infection finally manifests at about 18, 20, 22 weeks when the patient presents with preterm labor. So ladies and gentlemen, if we are to master the management of placental syndromes, we should also seriously look into how we can prevent or minimize infections. And this, I believe, will be key to preventing preterm labor. Now, what are the common infections that we should screen? I think we should look beyond the common organisms. Although E. coli is common, Although Klebsiella is common, although GBS is the most common, the normal swaps that we do will not pick up other organisms which may be prevalent among this group of patients. So I think beyond this E. coli, beyond Klebsiella, beyond GBS, we should screen for STDs. So all you need is a urine screening for asymptomatic bacteria, a cervical and a genital swab for Neisseria gonorrhea, Chlamydia trachomatis, trichomoniasis, mycoplasma, mycoplasma genitalium, and urea plasma. And if you treat STDs, you will eventually prevent preterm labor because patients who have got especially tubal diseases has got a higher prevalence of STD. And urea plasma has to be treated with doxycycline. And we should look for these organisms before embryo transfer or very early on in the pregnancy, because I believe treating and preventing infections will significantly reduce the incidence of preterm labor. How else can we minimize infections? I think the IVF experts need to really look into what is the optimal vaginal preparations during the procedure. Do you need to use normal saline? What are cleaning solutions which is optimal? or should we use other better vaginal preparations? Now, what is the optimal choice of antibiotics? Should we use rosafin? Is cafuroxime sufficient? Is unacin sufficient? 
Do we need to include doxycycline? Do we need an anaerobic coverage? I think we really need to look into vaginal preparations and antibiotic choice because during these interventions, we really need to reduce infections. I think we really, really need to look into sterility during invasive procedures and internal examinations because, ladies and gentlemen, infection is one trigger of preterm labor. The ISOC recently came up with how one should disinfect and clean front vaginal probes because this group of cohort of patients will have a lot of internal examination and hygiene of the probe is just as important as an internal examination. This group of patients also use a lot of vaginal suppositories, namely eutrogestin, and should really try to minimize the use or perhaps use it in a sterile environment. Although a lot of patients now use probiotics, I think the evidence remains controversial. It has never really been proven to prevent preterm labor, and it should be used not universally, but perhaps in a certain group of patients that perhaps may benefit. But the essential part is to maintain the normal vaginal flora. The essential part is to prevent an infection rather than subscribing probiotics. And one should be extremely cautious with the use of add-ons. I, for one thing, these add-ons causes more harm than benefit, especially steroids, especially immunotherapy, especially metformin. So it's important to discuss with an IVF expert. It's important to have a clear communication regarding what is the benefit, what is the minimum medications, and when to stop. And I think this key discussion is essential for optimal pregnancy outcomes. Aspirin, ladies and gentlemen, the RCOG guidelines, the NICE guidelines and the American guidelines now do not recommend routine aspirin for all IVF pregnancies. However, a certain cohort of IVF pregnancies will benefit from aspirin, and who are they? Patients conceived with a donor or a oocyte sperm, the incidence of preeclampsia can be as high as 20 to 25 percent, and I think they need aspirin. Patients with an unexplained fetal loss, perhaps due to a placental syndrome, or patients with a preterm delivery related to a placental syndrome may benefit from an aspirin. Patients with a new partner, patients with PCOS, patients with asymptomatic thrombophilia, low molecular weight heparin, no aspirin, perhaps. And patients with recurrent pregnancy loss, perhaps the unexplained group may benefit from aspirin. What is the recommended dose? Not 75, 150 milligrams taken at night, discarding the other half after 12 weeks of pregnancy. And I, for one thing, aspirin plays a significant role in management of placental syndromes, which I think is crucial with regards to antenatal management of IVF pregnancies. It's good to watch this space because I believe the science is slowly evolving especially with regards to the benefits of aspirin among IVF pregnancies. Now, does aspirin prevent preterm labor? Interestingly, the paper in Lancet, and another recent paper in BMC did show that aspirin prevents placental syndromes and prevents indirectly preterm labor. And hence, ladies and gentlemen, I believe aspirin has got an important role, especially among IVF patients, but the dose has to be 150 milligrams of night, discarding the other half. With that, ladies and gentlemen, what is my approach to IVF patients? I would first take a detailed history, exclude a genetic cause for the subfertility. They have a genetic cause, PGS may be beneficial. If they do not have a genetic cause, perhaps there's less benefits of a routine PGS. Then I would like to know whether this is a fresh cycle, a frozen cycle, or was there any ICSI because the risk of perinatal outcomes are significant? And was there a need for a PGS, but she still needs a prenatal diagnosis? Now, NICC has changed the way we practice obstetrics, but NICC should not be universal. NICC among IVF pregnancies may be complicated purely because there may be a vanishing twin, there may be a multiple pregnancy. It may be a donated oocyte or a donated sperm. The patient may be symptomatic bleeding or the patient may have a subcoronic hematoma. So NICC 
may be complicated. Use it carefully. Use the best prenatal diagnosis measures to screen. If unsure, you can always refer and discuss with an expert. Early on in the pregnancy, it's good to minimize add-ons. Avoid progesterones, no benefit. Avoid pregnisolon, no benefits. Slow down or cut down the use of metformin early on in the pregnancy. Immunotherapy perhaps is associated with more harm. I think we should stop screening for asymptomatic thrombophilia. There's no benefit. We should stop screening for MTHFR. There's no benefit. It does not improve maternal and fetal outcomes. And treating these patients with low molecular weight heparin perhaps may sometimes cause more harm than good. Although aspirin is not routine for everyone, I think a certain selected group of patients to manage placental syndromes, especially those with oocyte and sperm donors, will benefit from aspirin. I think we should screen for HbA1c. We should screen for thyroid, but keep it below 5. Screen for sexually transmitted diseases, vitamin D level supplementation, but we should also screen for asymptomatic bacteria, which I think is extremely prevalent among this cohort, but we should screen for STD. The patient presents in the first trimester with any red flag of headache, breathlessness, neurological signs, think of thrombosis, refer to an expert because the incidence of thrombosis is high. I think cervical surveillance is perhaps should be part of the antenatal management, but if the patient presents with preterm labor, it is often not the cervix, it is usually related to the placenta or usually related to an underlying infection. I think as an expert managing IVF pregnancies, we should try to suppress the placental syndrome. We should try to manage placental syndromes. The patient has got a previous pregnancy failure. We should look hard for CHI, and perhaps this cohort of patients may benefit from statins, low molecular weight heparin, and even an immune modulator. The antenatal management should include screening for infections, growth scans, looking at placental thickness, and also cervical lead measurements. If the patient has got an endometrial scratch to improve IVF success rate, we should also exclude an adherent placenta, which is non uncommon, which is not uncommon following an endometrial scratch. It's best to deliver these patients ideally by 39 weeks. So ladies and gentlemen, to conclude my talk, my recommendations for antenatal management of IVF pregnancies. I think pre-pregnancy review of not just the mother, but the couple is important. Maternal and paternal health optimization is extremely crucial. I think as an obstetrician, as an expert managing high-risk pregnancies, we should know the cost for the subfertility. We should know the details of the procedures, and we should one ensure that our aseptic measures were in place during the pre-implantation transfer, during the oocyte retrieval, and in the first trimester, and communicating between the IVF experts and the maternal fetal medicine doctors are extremely important. I think IVF pregnancies alone makes the woman high risk. We should have dedicated high risk MFM IVF clinics, something which I'm truly passionate about, and yes, a significant amount of patients that I see in my maternal medicine clinics are IVF pregnancies. There's no benefit of screening or treating for asymptomatic thrombophilia. Low molecular weight heparin should not be abused. Folic acid should not be abused beyond four weeks. But instead, we should screen for STD. We should screen for infections. We should screen for urea plasma. I think it should not be PGS for everyone. It should not be ICSI. For everyone, think of blastosis mosaicism, prenatal diagnosis, either a non invasive measure or a chorionic velar sampling or an amniocentesis remains gold standard. I think we seriously need to look into an evidence based first trimester management. We should really try to reduce manipulation in the first trimester because this is going to present with adverse pregnancy outcomes later on in the pregnancy. Hypoglycemia, especially following metformin, is harmful. Overtreatment and add-ons, especially immune modulators and steroids, is harmful. We should try to minimize the usage of these add-ons in the first trimester.
Think of thrombosis, which is not uncommon in the first trimester among IVF group of patients, but for one, which look beyond first trimester screening and anomaly screening, because these patients need growth scans, these patients need neutral artery Doppler, these patients need measurement of placental thickness, it is not just a first trimester scan and a review and a detailed scan. It's one you, what you do in between and throughout the pregnancy. We should also appreciate that NICC should not be routine. NICC, especially for this cohort of patients, may have limitations. We should consider aspirin based on individualized risks in the risk assessment, especially to optimally manage placental syndromes. If a patient presents with prematurity, it is often not the cervix. It is usually related to infections of placental symptoms. Do not undertake prophylactic surplages. Do not undertake history-related surplages. Do not undertake arabine pressuries. All of these causes more harm because you're going to cause more placental symptoms. You're going to cause more infection. The key is to prevent infection and the key is to prevent and manage placental symptoms. The cervix is innocent. The cervix is not the villain. Prophylactic measures are more helpful. Recommendations, aspirin, growth plans, placental thickness, aspirin, PLGF as a marker, and delivery by 39 weeks. But if there is a pregnancy failure, the answer lies in the placenta. Look for histiocytes. Rule out a CHI. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I think for optimal outcomes of IVF pregnancies, we need to work as a team. We need to talk about pre-pregnancy optimization of the couple. It is okay to refer to a maternal fetal medicine expert. It's good to see a good IVF expert who's going to precisely improve outcomes without over-treatment, without under-treatment, and without increasing the additional risk during pregnancy. I think we need to have dedicated maternal fetal medicine clinics purely to care for these high-risk IVF mothers. And they should ideally be cared and followed up and managed in a high-risk pregnancy period. And they need a team of a geneticist if there's a genetic cause, a dietitian, if they are diabetic or obese, the neonatologist, because the incidence of preterm delivery is high, including a mental health specialist, because the incidence of mental health is high. With that, ladies and gentlemen, my take home message we need better science to appreciate and manage obstetric complications following IVF because the current routine care is insufficient. I think we now need to realize. The complications are significant. We need distinction in obstetric care for this cohort of patients, especially with regards to preventing of infections and especially with regards to management of placental syndromes. Ladies and gentlemen, over-treatment causes more obstetric harm. Think of APS, not thrombophilia. No benefits of MTHFR screening. Think of infections and do not overtreat the cervix. The key for an optimal outcome is to manage placental syndromes effectively. With that, thank you so much for your attention. If you do have more questions, kindly reach out to us. We are www.obstetricmedicine.by. And thank you so much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen.